This is episode 10. Do you remember me? This is a filter podcast by Matt Walter. This is episode 10, and I appreciate all the support that the podcast has been given. And a few weeks ago on Instagram, I asked how we could celebrate the 10th episode, and I got a heap of suggestions. But the one that I got most was requests for me to tell a story of how I even got started in photography. Normally just tell this when, you know, I do a guest lecture spot or something like that, which sounds a bit wanky, but I do that. Uh, So if you need a speaking engagement or something like that, let me know. Uh, But yeah, Uh, I, I sort of tell this story, but the problem is I had to think a bit deeper because the purpose of the story is a little bit different because normally when I do those speaking things, I'm more talking about, you know, why it's worth doing photography or you can do it, you know, a bit of sort of a, an inspirational type of thing, I guess, as inspirational as, you know, I can be, but basically kids just look back at you and, and they, they seem bored until you put up the list of bands that you shoot for. And then all of a sudden they're interested. And then every question is, so do you like get to talk to the band? I'm like, I I would hope so. Otherwise that would be pretty rude and I wouldn't even want to work with them. So yeah, I had to, I had to go do some research. I had to reflect on uh, all the things that, you know, I've done to get me here. So I apologize for the delay in this episode, but I spent a lot of time thinking back to my experience so I can be as helpful as possible in this, this episode, but what better way to celebrate well, uh, you know, this 10th episode, it's the smallest milestone you could possibly have, but it's a milestone nonetheless. And I want to speak about that being the commonly asked question. And I want to stress that this is just my story. This isn't a blueprint that you can just apply and, you know, end up with success that looks exactly the same as mine. It doesn't all add up to a guaranteed result. And I shouldn't need to say that, but unfortunately, you know, I do. There's some people that try to just put the exact same things in place, but their work's different and they're different and their clients are different and they end up with a different result. But, you know, the result generally, you know, if I was trying to be someone else, I would just end up a worse version of that person. Or I would be a person that is sort of a shadow of the person that I'm emulating because they're always going to be doing something different and they're always going to be moving ahead. So be independent. Um, you know, it's not hard to outrun me, but if you're basing it off what I do, then you're going to run out of ideas and not know what to do in the first place. So anyway, here it is start to finish. I started photography in I think it was around 2014 and I had really bad social anxiety and I wanted to force myself to connect with more people. I I just found myself sitting inside, not really doing much at all. Um, But I used to be a really outgoing person and for some reason that changed. And so I wanted to force myself to talk to people that I otherwise wouldn't have spoken to. And I knew that I could do it. I knew I could get myself into that headspace you know, that I used to be in before I started to get into that headspace of having nothing to offer anyone. But the problem is when, like, when you get in that headspace where you feel like you have nothing to offer anyone, you end up not knowing anyone. And so I had nowhere to start. I had no one to help me. So I just went out and I bought a Nikon D90 and I took photos of anything in my backyard just to understand the settings. I took photos of flowers, things on the street, cars, you know, whatever was there. And they were all pretty bad. Like they weren't great. Uh, But at the time, you know, they, they seemed okay to me. But I knew that every shot that I took was practice. And even if I didn't see it at the time, my photos were hopefully getting better. But, you know, I shot everything that wasn't music really at the start. And after a while, I, I wanted to try my hand at music photography because I'm like, I like, I like music. Why not? Right. And I knew that I might not necessarily be good at it, but you know, that's, that's what I love most. And so even if I don't make any money from it, it'd be cool to just do it. And I started to feel like my passion for photographing the same content over and over again, it was, it was decreasing because it was always just the same thing. 
And I felt like I was getting better technically, but I was just photographing the same stuff over and over again, like the same flower, same plant. My satisfaction, it just wasn't increasing at the same rate as, uh, you know, my technical skills, I guess. But one thing that I didn't have the ability to get access to was music. So I wanted to do it, but how the hell do I, uh, you know, get access to do it? You can't just like go to your backyard and, and there's a band playing. So I, in, in that sense, I totally get why people feel like music photography is, is one of the harder things to break into because you can't just create the subject matter. And I, you know, I want to again, stress that, you know, you shouldn't use this as a blueprint because you need to be on your own journey. But if you use my experience as a building block or just a starting point, hopefully it should just be a little bit easier for you. And then you can find your own way to scale your presence as a music photographer. So having said that, this is what I did. I looked at the less busy venues in Brisbane. That's where I'm based, I'm Brisbane music photographer. And I looked at, you know, the smaller venues because I knew that smaller bands would be playing smaller venues and the bigger bands would be at the more popular venues. And so smart money was to avoid the competition entirely because competent competition would just crush me. It would just destroy me while I was at my most vulnerable and, and, you know, least confident. So I went looking for bands that didn't have photographers already asking them to shoot their show. So it would be almost a guaranteed thing, um, you know, to get access to that. And avoiding the competition was the easiest way to build a portfolio without any setbacks because, you know, I wasn't thinking too big or getting too ahead of myself without, you know, competing with the more experienced photographers. I found a few bands listed on gig posters around Brisbane and, you know, just Googling um, these venues and looking in uh, publications, you know, street press stuff. And I hadn't heard of any of these bands, but I quickly just checked online, you know, just did a background check. And it seemed like no one had heard of the bands either. And I knew it was my biggest chance to offer a mutually beneficial opportunity to both them and to me, uh, because I was an experienced an inexperienced music photographer um, and the band needed some photos because they were not inexperienced, but they hadn't played many shows. So they hadn't, you know, they're less known. They don't have as much promotional material or photos that they can just save from a street press article or anything like that because they're they're probably a new band the opportunity had to be mutually beneficial because i needed the band to arrange the photo pass and the band needed the photos to promote their future shows so that's where it was you know a mutually beneficial offer to them because a photo pass is what i needed and at random, I just picked a, a band called Poncho Pilot at this small bar that doesn't exist anymore called Beetle Bar in, um, I don't know, I think it's Bowen Hills or something. But by the time the show had finished and Poncho Pilot was finished, I had around 400 photos, but they were all blurry. They were all dark, underexposed, and just even the ones that I sort of could salvage were just uninspiring. And I'd completely underestimated the difficulty of music photography. The darkness and the subject matter, you know, the, the movement required of the subject, you know, had left my head spinning and I had really what I felt to be nothing to offer the band after the show. And my wife reminded me that the reason why I was even shooting a smaller band to begin with was to minimize the risk. So I shouldn't feel bad about it. If I'd be given an opportunity to shoot an international band without experience, the situation would have been much uglier because I would have been letting someone down that had their total faith in me to deliver the photos that were on par with more experienced music photographers that they selected me over. And I repeated this pattern of finding smaller bands to photograph, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And if a band was going under the radar of other band photographers that that benefited me because I could build a portfolio and then, you know, a network of people within the industry that could help me later on. So I just kept contacting smaller bands who weren't receiving online blog coverage. 
And I knew that the bands would work the hardest to get me the photo pass because they were also getting something out of it. Once my initial year of music photography was complete, I had a portfolio that I could stand behind. Even if it was much weaker than I wanted, I had a portfolio and I didn't have that beforehand. My portfolio told people that I had a camera and I had done this a few times before. That's all it needed to do. It just needed to say, hey, here's some proof. I ended up getting sick of spending so much time organizing my own photography opportunities. And so I contacted a few small online blogs and I asked them to consider me as a photography contributor. I showed them my portfolio that I created and the mutual benefit had shifted away from me needing a photo pass for anything to me needing access to some of the biggest shows. So my work was more familiar to those looking at my portfolio once I refreshed it. After contacting probably, I think it was three different websites, I waited and it felt like I waited for months. And then the AU review contacted me and, and they said they'd love to have me on board. And I felt like this was the final square for my photography journey. Like I thought, you know, I had reached the peak and it won't get any better from this day forward. Mark it in your calendars, the day that Matt Walter reached the top. Obviously it did get better, but I think it's always important to celebrate the small wins that I felt like were big wins at the time, because that's what, that's what keeps you motivated. Publications are important for emerging photographers because they're like a dressed up internship. And once you graduate from the internship, they'll let you into the staff room so you can eat some of the nicer food but you're still receiving the same internship salary and that's zero dollars per week for those who haven't been there before. But taking a step back from that analogy, you shoot the smaller bands for the publication so you can pick and choose who you want to shoot, which will be the bigger bands. And complaints fly, they fly around all the time towards publications for taking advantage of emerging photographers. And I've contributed to many, so I can speak from experience that it's not always the case. It is sometimes, but it's not always the case. Publications often make less money than the cost of hosting the website, meaning that no one's getting paid for the work that they're putting into it. Not just the photographer, no one's getting paid. If, you, if you're not doing it for the love of it, no matter what your role is in the music industry, you're never going to make it. You know, you may eventually, but you're, you're never going to make it if you're not doing it for the love of it first and foremost. So I contributed to the AU review for a little over a year before I started to become a little frustrated. I'd worked tirelessly photographing small bands that disappeared weeks after their first show. It just kept happening. I kept seeing my work build towards something that didn't serve any, you know, greater purpose. And I emailed the editor and I asked why I wasn't getting allocated bigger bands. And they said, your work's fine, but we have heaps of contributors that have been photographing for us for much longer than you have. And they get the first pick of bands to cover. And I could understand that, but I, you know, I'd been working hard, but they had also been working super hard and they've been doing it for longer. So I contacted other publications in the hopes of having more places to contribute, which would create more opportunities to be assigned the bands that I want to photograph. And so I was approved to join Tone Deaf as a photography contributor. And soon after AMH Network, which is no longer around, um, but I love those guys. And so I was shooting for three publications at the time and all were unpaid. But even still, I was missing out on getting photo passes to cover some of the shows. Every publication had, you know, their own photographers who had been there for longer. So just because I was on the team doesn't mean that I was, you know, getting equal opportunity because there had been other photographers that had been there for much longer. And so contributing to more publications didn't help me get more opportunities, really. And then Title Fight announced a tour the band title fight, they announced a tour and that would change the way that I photographed music, but I still had no photo pass. And I think that was one of the bands that I missed out on a photo pass from when I was contributing to, um, those three publications. 
and I was desperate to photograph title fight. And on the smallest chance I contacted, you know, the, uh, the owners of a local venue and that venue is Crowbar, which, you know, I've met a lot of people at and photographed a lot of bands there, but I just hit them up and I asked them directly to see if cameras were allowed inside the venue for paying ticket holders. And I got a reply pretty quick. And it said that it was totally fine to bring in my camera as long as I stayed out of the side stage area. So I bought my $25 ticket and I photographed the whole show without the support of publications. So I had no photo pass. I just had my $25 ticket and I knew I could bring my camera in. And it was liberating. It was sweaty. It was uh, iconic, I guess. You know, the sense of freedom I had to operate as an independent photographer is it's difficult to describe until you actually feel it. And I had made no guarantees for a body of work that would follow after the show. It was just a deal between me and my $25 gig ticket. Knowing Crowbar was open to ticket holders, bringing in their own cameras was where my career really took off. And I could take more risks because I knew that there was no client who was relying on my photos. The word risk, I think, sounds a bit too negative, but... The risks were what defined my style and allowed me to think outside the box without, you know, any consequences. There was minimal consequences. So I kept thinking differently. Before photographers widely returned to Polaroid film, I shot the Bronx on a, you know, a, this little crappy uh, Polaroid 210 camera I bought when I was in Japan. And the Bronx are a sweaty punk band from New York, perfect for Crowbar's venue setting. And as soon as Matt, the singer, stepped off the stage, um, like jumped off the stage and tore through, you know, the audience, I knew the time was right for me to take another risk. So I barged into the mosh pit and I held my camera above my head, this flimsy piece of crap. And I was worried with how fragile the camera was in the mosh pit, but I held it above my head and I kept hitting the shutter. And I kept just reefing out the Polaroid film after each shot. And I just kept stuffing it in my pocket. And I could feel the motor vibrate from inside the camera, turning out, you know, turning the Polaroid out of the top. So I knew when to grab it. I think I spent like 40 bucks in film that night firing shot after shot. And I just left with pockets full of developed Polaroid film. And the Polaroid shots were, uh, they were crushed and battered by the end of it. Uh, but Vice Magazine, they saw an opportunity for themselves and... Uh, noisy music by Vice, they asked me if they could run the photos. For a solid week, I reckon, after the article ran, my email blew up with all sorts of requests. I could have worked for weeks off the opportunities that rolled in, but the only work that I wanted to do now was to decide on how to leverage my current exposure. So I just continued to take risks with how I shot. And I later tore my back open, wriggling along the ground, trying to get underneath Luke Henry of, of Violent Soho. And I, I rode on Damien from Fucked Up's shoulders and, you know, when they were at Soundwave. Um, you know, you really got to put yourself out there, I guess, to get something different. And that kind of stuff is not ultimately what defined me, but it is, you know, how I define myself for how I worked and, helped keep me motivated it was those kind of decisions that delivered different work and i just kept doing it late one night i received a message from the owner of crowbar and all it wrote was just hey mate and i was nervous and immediately thought i had done something wrong because i hadn't got a photo pass for them you know for some time now and i'd been buying tickets to shows with the sole purpose of photographing them and the, you know, my social anxiety immediately thought that I'd done something wrong, you know, that I got in someone's way or, you know, weren't really um, buying a ticket for the real reason you should be buying a ticket, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but that's what I was worried about. And the whole concept of photo passes started to feel really foreign to me. And I just stayed positive about it. And you know, the reply that came after that was something like, you know, you take a mean photo, come into the bar this week and let's grab a beer. You'll find me out the back of the room with the old dudes was something that I scribbled down that I think it was 
it was very close to what it said. And I was really relieved, but I was curious because I had no idea what Trad, who's the owner of Crowbar, I had no idea what he wanted to talk about. Blindly meeting someone felt really odd, you know, to someone with the levels of anxiety that I have, but I did it anyway because good things don't just fall in your lap. You got to go out and get them. And when I, when I went and I met up with Trad, knowing nothing about him, um, he greeted me like an old friend and he told me of these plans for the bar and how he had this vision of making it a home for artists of more than just music, but creative arts as well. And I remember not really being sure what he was asking you know, me for or what he was asking of me, whether he wanted me to provide photos for the walls of the bar extension or you know, something completely different. And he said, just be a wallpaper, come in, shoot what you want, you know, send us some photos, and, you know, if you want us to use them on Facebook. And it was, it was really wild hearing him rattle off a list of opportunities that I would be ecstatic to just hear, you know, one offer of. And shooting a band after they came through Crowbar as the exclusive house photographer increased my Rolodex you know, five times and it was swelling with new friends and, you know, people that I had met that wanted a copy of the photos that I took because I was there every time without fail. And consistency was the, the most important part of this stage of uh, my journey. Io Crowbar really, you know, Io Crowbar everything for offering me that kind of exclusivity. It meant so much to me and it, it connected me with so many people. The music industry is a really small world and it seems like everyone has worked with everyone at least once, but they keep in touch because relationships within the industry are not centered within the city that you live in. It's not confined to that. The music industry's lifeblood moves between cities and it can go in any direction. It's kind of like a, a traveling circus that you've been asked to participate in. You meet an endless stream of people with different purposes and different stories to tell. And sitting in the middle of that stream and touching everything that flows past allows you to become familiar with so much. I photographed at Crowbar three or four times a week. It, it was and still is um, my second home. Every artist that passed through Crowbar on their tours had a house photographer ready to take photos because Crowbar treated me like they treat their bands. That's why everyone loves Crowbar so much because they treat everyone so well, like a, you know, big family, whether you're just a patron or whether you're, you know, a band. And I wanted to treat the bands the way that Crowbar had treated me. And the bands had content that they could use for social media immediately the day before. And that's where Crowbar Couch formed. If you had sort of seen uh, the photos that Crowbar posts, a lot of them are sitting on this couch under the Crowbar logo. Because I was thinking, you know, knowing an artist needs a photo for their social media and seeing the pride that they have for playing at Crowbar made me realize that there's an opportunity available that benefits everyone. So the couch in Crowbar's green room was a perfect centerpiece for, you know, uniform guaranteed to be used social media content. And that might be my marketing side coming out, but soon my username was plastered from one side of social media to the other. And people who followed those bands were subscribing to me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And as my Instagram following increased, I optimized my content and I kept it uniform. I didn't just post, you know, whatever there was, there's a formula there. And the benefit to having a background in digital marketing meant I already knew the power of social media. Planning the content was already in my DNA. I just had to maintain consistency over time. Consistency is just one part of the recipe of great social media. I knew if I wanted to have my name appear in front of as many followers as possible, I need to photograph as many bands as possible. The marketing would just grow legs and carry my username naturally, even when I was out shooting and not actively doing any marketing. 
And that way I could focus on shooting and having fun doing it without trying to split myself too far from the marketing efforts. I met Luke Henry for the first time at a clown shop, Crowbar. I can't remember the specifics of, you know, how we knew of each other, but I just got talking about how he was doing some work on, on Crowbar's stage when they first built it. It's all a bit vague because of, you know, I'm getting to this story because there's sort of a story within a story, kind of like a Simpsons episode. And I was already a few beers deep. And so I wasn't really in a hurry to get home. And so me and Henry, we drank a few more beers and then he went home um, and I hadn't had a chance to speak properly with clowns about their upcoming Riot Fest appearance. Cause I was like, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go over there with them or offer to go over there with them, see if they're keen. And Stevie and Jake from clowns were, they would be in DJ for the night at Crowbar after their gig. So I left my camera beside Jake um, to look after. And after a few more beers, I started to collect my gear and put it into my bag ready to leave, but my camera wasn't in there. So I just assumed that the camera, lens, flash, battery, all that stuff would just be behind the bar. And looking at the security footage the next day, the legends at Crowbar, like, man, they found this moment a thief had snuck up behind Jake and swiped the camera under his hoodie and calmly walked out. And Trad called and confidently told me that my camera would make its way back to me. And this stuff doesn't happen at Crowbar. And I'd, I had been around there long enough to know that Crowbar is the one place where this stuff does not happen. But there's idiots everywhere. And sometimes this is going to happen. And it, it didn't work in my favor this time. And I wanted to believe that my camera would, would get back to me. But I was so deflated about it. And I could only imagine my photography journey being over and trad was like well we'll throw a fundraiser like we'll throw a fundraiser if we have to if we don't get the camera back you will photograph again and that he was confident that they'll get it back and he said i'll put up a, a facebook post up tonight and i'm not sure like i've tried to tell trad but i'm not sure if he knows how much his support meant and continues to mean to me because it was my mistake ultimately for leaving my camera there but it's Trad's blind confidence in the universe just working out. That was what I needed. And over the next 48 hours, the Facebook post went viral. Over 550,000 people saw the post. Members of bands all over the world shared it amongst their networks, including members you know, of really big bands like NoFX. And my phone buzzed endlessly for the next 10 days. And I got messages from hundreds of people that I didn't know. And that said, Hey, look, you know, I don't know you, but they were sharing their frustrations, sending photos of people who looked like the thief trying to help out doing some, um, you know, civil detective work. And then some of them were even offering to lend me their camera gear, like until I got a replacement and it was just amazing. And 10 days after the camera was stolen, I got a call from a detective who told me that he was about to go out and collect my camera from the thief and that he had found it. And he told me that the only reason they were able to find the thief was because of the information that related, you know, to, you know, what the, the social media audience had offered because of the Facebook post that went viral. Even Sunrise, which is a morning show in Australia for those, you know, international listeners, uh, they called me and they wanted to do a story on the power of social media, but I had everything that I needed. So I was like, nah, not interested. Like I had my camera, faith in the universe and an endless amount of appreciation, gratitude for the Crowbar family and everyone that helped spread the word. Obviously I wouldn't recommend photographers lose their camera to, you know, help their name go viral. But what my lost camera taught me is that, you know, what you give to others, you get back a hundred times over. And if you haven't got it back yet, you will like just, you know, that's just good karma. It was proof that you get out what you put in. I knew Luke from Soho a few months you know, before that, like that happened a few months before. And then I got this email from the head of Soho's record label. And he said, 
um, that, you know, Luke told him that I might be free to photograph the behind the scenes of their like soda clip. And I was so keen. I, I remember just jumping at it so quickly and I text Luke immediately after and I thanked him for the recommendation. And I think he wrote something, he wrote something back like, you know, you got to look after the homies and that was it. And that job, that one job provided me with so much, you know, it led to all the future Soho work, including all the stuff on Laneway Festival. You know, they introduced me to June Rats, who introduced me to Skeggs. They introduced me to Smith Street Band, who introduced me to Series and so on. And I never sought out a friendship to book a job. In my experience, that's the biggest mistake I've seen up and coming photographers make. If you build a natural foundation of solid work consistently over a longer period of time, you're going to naturally land, you know, in situations where you meet talented people, your paths will just cross. The best work that you can do is based on trust and that shouldn't be fabricated or forced in any way. You know, meet people, share experiences through common interests and just forget about the work. Sounds counterproductive, but, you know, then you create the work side by side and you collaborate. Anyway, I told you this episode would be longer than normal, but uh, what better way to celebrate the 10th episode than, you know, answering the question that I get more asked more than anything, which is how do I get started with music photography? So in summary, every opportunity that I've been given is from hard work, consistency, and naturally built friendships. But you also need to take the opportunity to benefit from situations that you're in, and that's where your choices come into play. So that's the 10th episode. That's the that's that's how I ended up where I am now. Now it's just, uh, you know, photographing for bands that I love that have friends of mine in it, which is awesome. So I'm sorry for the delay on the episode, but, you know, we're clocking in around half an hour and the goal was to make these 15 minutes long, but, you know, it's double as long. So that kind of makes sense. Next episode, I'll probably jump uh, straight back into answering some more questions that you send through. So if you have any questions about the story I just told or something completely different, hit me up and, you know, maybe we can answer them next episode. You can hear older versions older episodes, versions, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, you can hear older episodes of Filter at filter.mattwalterphoto.com slash podcast. And you can also submit your question there, or you can hit me on social media, uh, wherever I am. My username is generally Matt Walter Photo. Filter is also on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, who knows where else, but you'll probably be using one of them. So I hope everyone has a great fortnight. Thanks for your patience with this episode. I hope it was helpful and get out and take some awesome pics.